What's up guys? It's yo boy on the sensei. Welcome to What If Zoro Was Reborn in JJK as Toji's Son, Part 4. Like, share, and comment on the video. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed. Remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Join my Patreon to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Hearing Yaga's words, Toji let out a dry laugh. He could vividly imagine how the old folks of the Zenin would react. I don't know how much that assistant supervisor knows or what he blabbered about. If the fact that Zoro is a non-sorcerer hasn't been disclosed and only the name Zenin Zoro was reported to the headquarters, they would be perplexed yet curious about the sudden appearance of a new Zenin name. Whether he's really a Zenin, whose child he is, if he was born with any inherited techniques, dreaming if he could be a sorcerer comparable to Goho Satoru. If he really was a sorcerer with inherited techniques, they'd probably be plotting to quietly take him in as their adopted son. And if it was reported that Zoro is a non-sorcerer, well would they call him a monster? Like they did with Toji. As these thoughts filled his mind, a sickening rage twisted in his stomach. His hands tingled. He wanted to burst out and slaughter everyone who had hurt Zoro. Those who carelessly reported him to the headquarters, and everyone who spoke thoughtlessly about Zoro. Toji clenched his fists so tightly his knuckles might bleed then slowly relax them. Killing was easy. On the day he went to end everything with the Zenin family, Toji could have killed them all. He refrained, recalling the promise he made to Chia that evening, not wanting to meet her drenched in blood. Now, with his mastery of Haki, it would be even easier. Could the old men of the Jujutsu headquarters, even with their sorcery, stand against him armored with Haki? It would be difficult. Later, such matters could wait. What's important now is Zoro's safe recovery. Dealing with the old men for what they've already done and what they're about to do. Finding out why Zoro encountered a special grade curse in the middle of a department store in broad daylight. Investigating why Sukuna's finger was inside Zoro's belt. All of that can be done later. After thoroughly interrogating those involved, scouring both the sorcerer and non-sorcerer worlds to find out who's behind this then killing those who need to be killed and punishing those who deserve it. After Zoro has safely recovered, until then, he needed to be by Zoro's side. Because the current Zoro doesn't have the strength to deal with a second threat. If, though, it's unlikely. If Zoro doesn't wake up, or if he leaves his side forever, like Chia did. Well, whatever I do then, it wouldn't matter. Whether Toji does good or evil, there would be no one left to acknowledge or reprimand him. If that happens, guilty or not. I might really kill them all, but that won't happen, because Zoro is strong. Because he loves Toji, knowing how much Toji would be hurt by the death of a family member, he would cling to the Reaper's neck if necessary to survive. That's what had to be believed. Toji broke the silence and spoke. As long as my son is alive, I won't cause trouble here. Meaning, don't provoke me needlessly, just go away. Whether Yaga understood this or not, he quietly disappeared with a backward step. Sumiki, with big brown eyes brimming with tears, clutched Toji's arm and shook it. Mr. Zoro will be okay, right? My brother will be okay, right? Yeah. Toji hugged the sobbing Tsumiki and Megumi tightly. The sweat seeping into his palm felt cool. Zoro would be okay. He had to be. Otherwise, everything would become meaningless. And then, five days passed. Creak, creak. The sound of metal clashing was heard. Something seemed off, as if it was losing its balance. Creak, crack. Something broke. Even in his groggy state of consciousness, Zoro was acutely aware of that fact. Zoro slowly opened his eyes in the ward of the Metropolitan Curse Technical College. In front of him was Toji. He was so close that Zoro could feel his breath, leaning in with his green eyes darting around, scrutinizing Zoro's every movement. He looked both incredulous and ecstatic. As Zoro tried to sit up immediately, Toji's hands quickly moved behind Zoro's back helping him to sit up slowly. Zoro felt like he could have gotten up on his own, but Toji looked too serious. His physical condition was surprisingly good. There was no pain, and unlike in his past life, where he would usually be wrapped in suffocating bandages, there were none. Looking around, the place seemed like a hospital. Zoro noticed Megumi and Tsumiki, lying side by side on the bed opposite him, making soft snoring sounds as they slept. Those two, they're not hurt, just sleeping. That was a relief. They hadn't been injured the last time he saw them. And hearing Toji's voice now, he had thought they would be okay. And you, I'm not hurt either. That's good. Zoro was the only one among his family who had been injured, and now he was up and about. Toji said nothing. Zoro glanced around. Where are we? We're at the school. The school. Why are we here? There was no response. Instead, Toji lowered his head and rubbed it against the side of Zoro's leg. It was an odd gesture, like a beaten animal submitting to the leader of the pack, seeming to seek forgiveness or perhaps expressing regret. It looked anxious, scared, and in some ways, resigned. Zoro watched Toji's actions for a moment, and then shook his head. Really? 
When Toji flinched, Zoro quickly pulled his head into his embrace and gently stroked his dark hair. It seemed he needed to calm him down first, before they could talk about what happened. Zoro hugged Toji's head tightly, and Toji trembled slightly, burrowing further into Zoro's embrace. There was no need to cling this much, with the hearing of a thousand demon queller, it was impossible not to hear Zoro's heartbeat. Yet, the way Toji pressed his ear against Zoro's chest to listen to his heartbeat resembled a young animal refusing to leave its injured mother's side. Were you that scared? Indeed, from Toji's perspective, it must have been the first time seeing Zoro this injured. While Zoro was accustomed to such situations, Toji certainly was not. What happened? I'm sorry. That's why I'm asking you to tell me what happened, so I can be angry or fix it. Because I couldn't come, you but you did come. Toji did come to Zoro. It's just that Zoro had dealt with the troublemaker before there was a need for him to step in. Again, you brought me to the school. I already told you that. But why? This was the only place where you could be treated. I see. Now I understand why you brought me to the place I didn't want to go. Anything else? Is that all? You don't trust me. I do trust you. It's just not me. Yourself. Toji's issue wasn't with trusting Zoro. He didn't trust himself. Not trusting himself, he relies on others within his range. That's why, even after making the right choice, he continues to feel anxious. Toji fears that Zoro will be angry with him. That Zoro will hate him for the decisions he makes. Apart from their mutual care, this was entirely different from his past life's comrades, who had their own firm opinions and stubbornness often leading to fights. You need to be shameless, you know. I'm sorry. Don't apologize. Pirates do not apologize for the choices they make based on their beliefs even if those choices lead to adverse outcomes. Especially now, when there hasn't been a bad outcome, Toji is too submissive. Why he can't trust himself that much is something Zoro couldn't fully understand. Zoro was someone who, no matter what anyone said or faced any defeats, never doubted that he would become the strongest one day. It was frustrating. Toji silently hugged Zoro tighter. Zoro awkwardly placed his hands around Toji's back. Zoro doesn't know how much this small, lukewarm warm keeps Toji alive, and how much it terrifies him. I'm afraid that you might die because of me, because of Toji's bloodstained past, because Zoro was born being pointed at by everyone from the moment of birth, afraid that his son might be broken before he even really gets to live. Toji spoke as if vomiting out his deepest fear. Zoro looked at Toji quietly and then said coldly, that's a weight you, as a parent, have to bear. If Zoro had died, Toji couldn't deny his responsibility. Protecting his child is a parent's duty. Ash, not that everything is Toji's fault. Let me make it clear. It was my choice to confront that guy head on. Zoro could have stalled for time until Toji arrived, but he chose to face the enemy directly. It wasn't something Toji asked, instructed, or ordered Zoro to do. It was entirely Zoro's will. Not everything bad that happens to me is your fault. When a strong curse appeared, it was Zoro who, despite the difficulty, seized the opportunity to fight. He had no intention of shifting the blame for that choice onto Toji. Toji looked at Zoro for a moment. He didn't want him to be hurt. He didn't want him to live bound by constraints. He wanted him to do whatever he wished. But he was too powerless, too powerless to properly give him anything. Yet, Zoro's grey eyes looking at Toji were calm, without any blame or reprimand. A memory from long ago surfaced in Toji's mind. There was just one other person who had forgiven him with such eyes. It was Chie. Toji spoke with a voice choked with emotion. You are you resemble your mother too much. Before even asking what that meant, Toji suddenly pulled Zoro into a hug. I love you. I love you hearing these words that sounded almost like a soliloquy. Zoro wrapped his small hands around Toji's back in return. Pretending not to notice the tears soaking his shoulder, Zoro whispered the same words back into Toji's ear. Fushiguro Tsumiki like Megumi. It had been that way since she first saw him at the playground. His spiky hair was fascinating, and up close, his round, white face was pretty. So, she asked to play together. Playing with Megumi was fun. Sumiki played with Megumi the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that. Even when she went to bed alone at home, she fell asleep thinking about what they would play the next day. Sumiki grew to like Megumi more and more, but it was different with Mr. Toji and Zoro. It wasn't that Sumiki disliked the two. Playing house, where they acted as the dad and the family dog, was fun. They always ate delicious things together, and they would read fairy tales to Tsumiki and Megumi. Sometimes, when Toji and Zoro would grab the blanket from both sides and lift it with Megumi and her on top, making it bounce like a Viking ship, it was incredibly fun. Rolling around in the blanket with Megumi and laughing was absolutely wonderful. Still, it wasn't the same as with Megumi. With the two of them even though they were right there, it felt as if they were immensely far apart. They had their own stories their own games, and saw something only they could see. Sometimes, Megumi looked in the same direction as them. But when Tsumiki looked there, there was nothing. It was the same with Tsumiki's mom and dad. Even though they were right there, they always had their own stories and only saw each other. When she asked, they told her to go to her room or to play outside at the playground. Tsumiki felt immensely distanced from her mom and dad. 
but she silently did as they said. She believed that someday, just as much as they had grown distant, they would come that much closer to her. Without looking back, when dad left and didn't return after three nights, and then three more, and until mom came home with a man Sumiki had never seen before. That's when she realized, people who grow distant by that much can just disappear and never come back. So, Sumiki kept her distance from them. She thought that maybe one day, one of the two would just disappear like her dad did. She just hoped Megumi wouldn't disappear along with them. And then, they disappeared. In a way Sumiki could never have imagined. When Mr. Toji left, and the world turned dark, Sumiki was terrified. She couldn't see anything, and all she could do was hold Megumi tightly. Each time she heard thumping and crashing sounds not far away, tears trickled down her face. And when the world came back, Sumiki saw Zoro, covered in red. Blood, which should only come out a little even with a fall, covered Zoro's entire body. She couldn't imagine how many falls it would take to bleed that much. Hearing Zoro's instruction not to look, Sumiki understood. He was trying to protect us, to protect me and Megumi. That moment, she realized, it wasn't Zoro who was distant, it was Sumiki. The events that followed went by in a blur and were hard to remember. Mr. Toji ran incredibly fast, and Sumiki threw up. Mr. Toji and some people she hadn't seen before, kept speaking in terms Sumiki didn't understand, but that didn't matter anymore. After the brown-haired sister took Zoro away and then brought him back, Zoro turned green again. But he kept sleeping. Sumiki, in front of the sleeping Zoro, could only repeat the words she couldn't say out loud in her dreams. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I didn't dislike you. I was scared. I was afraid you wouldn't come back, like dad. I won't keep my distance anymore. Brother someone gently stroked Sumiki's hair as she talked in her sleep. In the cozy warmth, Sumiki slowly opened her eyes. Are you awake? Zoro, neither red nor asleep, was sitting on the edge of the bed, looking down at her. Zoro softly touched Sumiki's forehead. It's about time to get up. You two haven't eaten lunch yet. His words, delivered calmly, were the same as usual. In a situation where Tsumiki was unsure if it was a dream or reality, she hesitantly called out to Zoro. Brother. Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah. That's good. Really good. Hiru, yet Tsumiki. Why, Ella? Sumiki burst into tears and threw herself into Zoro's arms, who awkwardly embraced her. She cried her heart out, her face a mess of tears and snot. I'm sorry. Hiru, my fault. It was me, me. So far away. Huh. Hey, I. What exactly did you do wrong? No. It's okay. Just stop crying for now. You'll get dehydrated if you cry like that. Woayel, um, uh, Woayel? Calm down, both of you. Megumi and Sumiki only stopped crying after being comforted by Toji and Zoro. Previously, when the family played house, Sumiki played the role of mother, Zoro played the role of father, Megumi played the role of son, and Toji played the role of the family's little puppy. Stop crying. Blow your nose too. Humph. Yuru humph. That's right. Good. Now, Megumi, you too humph. Listening to the faint voices of the children from beyond the hospital room, Yeri Shoko put a cigarette to her lips and lit it with a lighter. Shoko had been in the hospital room for a while, since Toji had pressed the call bell, as soon as Zoro woke up. But after seeing the chaos of the biggest child trying to calm down two crying children, she neatly closed the door and left again. The patient looked perfectly fine at a glance. Zenin Zoro? Huh? He was quite unique, even from the perspective of Yeri who had seen many sorcerers, non-sorcerers, and corpses, that was the case. He had bled so much, but was still alive. The blood volume for men is about 8% of their body weight, and for women, it's about 7%. Non-sorcerers are in danger of life if they lose about 30% of their total blood volume. Sorcerers can lose a bit more, but at most around 40%. It's even more critical for children. The amount of blood Zen and Zoro had lost that day was clearly lethal. A user of the reverse curse technique, but for that his recovery speed was slow. Maybe because of the poison. Detoxifying poison with a reverse curse technique is very tricky. These past few days, Tokyo Metropolitan Curse Technical College and the upper echelons had been noisy over whether this kid was a sorcerer or a non-sorcerer. The only person who could answer definitively, the kid's dad, has been keeping his mouth shut, no matter what the higher-ups say, and hasn't left the kid's side for days. Goho, who has six eyes, is wandering outside the college. The person in question is lying in bed sick, and the rest are kids under five years old. Either way, it's remarkable. If he's a non-sorcerer, it means he endured that much blood loss through sheer will. And if he's a sorcerer, it means he could perform the reverse curse technique at that age. If it's the latter, Shoko might get a colleague as the only reverse curse technique user currently being overworked. But she wasn't particularly pleased about it. It's not something a kid should do. Like all sorcerers, but especially reverse curse technique users, they often see death. Not only do they see sorcerers who died during treatment, but reverse curse technique users also handle the post-mortem care of sorcerers' corpses. If not, who knows what might happen. Moreover, this kid was even younger than when Shoko caught the eye of the higher-ups at the Jujutsu headquarters. 
Even Shoko didn't start working as a reverse curse technique user before entering elementary school. Goho strolled up from the end of the hallway, fiddling with something. Goho hadn't been at the college these past few days without being on a mission. There was some family business, Suguru said nonchalantly. Shoko didn't pay much attention. She wasn't interested. What are you doing there, SHO Tilvako? What about you? What are you doing here? It should be Yaga Sensei's class time now. If you're back, you should hurry back to the classroom. At Shoko's words, Goho shrugged and pushed his sunglasses up with a grin. I'm playing hooky. Could you not say that so proudly? I don't want to get scolded by Yoga Sensei because I covered for you playing hooky. You're playing hooky too, Shoko. I have a patient to examine. It's different from your case. Seeing Goho's sparkling six eyes, Shoko realized she might have inadvertently provoked him. She didn't know why, but her words seemed to have triggered this lunatic. Knock, knock. Goho Satoru knocked on the hospital room door. I'm coming in. Bang. And without giving anyone inside a chance to react, he quickly opened the door and entered. That crazy guy. Shoko, startled, hastily rubbed out the cigarette, but she had finished smoking in a non-wooden area, and followed him in. Bang. Goho Satoru, upon entering the hospital room, strode towards the bed where Zoro's family was huddled together. Then, he stiffly placed his arms alongside his body and bent at the waist at a right angle. I'm suring. His voice was so loud that Shoko, who followed him in, immediately covered her ears. She grimaced in disgust. Really crazy. Hick. Sumiki, who was nestled to Zoro's left side, started hiccuping in surprise. Toji handed Sumiki a bottle of water. Struggling to open it, Zoro naturally took the bottle, opened it, and handed it back to her. Zoro frowned. What was this guy doing showing up all of a sudden and scaring the kid? Both father and Sumiki. He couldn't understand why so many people were apologizing to him today. Especially when neither of them really had anything to apologize for. As for Goho Satoru, he wasn't sure. Hopefully, this guy isn't going to start crying and clinging to me. He was ready to cut him down if that happened. The only reason he wasn't doing it right now was because, despite the over-exaggeration and playfulness, he couldn't sense any falsehood or malice from him. Which meant the intention to apologize was genuine. Even more ridiculous. Let's get out of H.E.I. -E. Tilda Shoko quickly assessed the situation and dashed out of the room. She felt it would be troublesome to get involved. When you apologize, Zoro calmly began to speak. You need to state what you did wrong and why you did it. Simply screaming sorry doesn't make it an apology. Well, Zoro himself wasn't great at apologizing to others, either. He would never apologize for something he didn't believe was wrong. Goho straightened up and scratched the back of his white head. Then, casually, he dropped a bombshell. The thing about you encountering the special grade curse, it seems like it was my fault. What? Sumiki, who had been hiccuping, jumped in shock, and Zoro's eyebrows shot up. Sumiki stepped in front of Zoro, her eyes blazing with anger, and glared at Satoru. Did you send that monster to torment my brother? Are you the one who hurt my brother Megumi also swelled up in anger and stepped down from the bed towards Satoru. Then, he began to swing his small fists at Satoru's legs. Hit! Hit! Hey! Missed me! Goho Satoru effortlessly deflected Megumi's punches and stuck out his tongue mockingly. Zoro observed Goho's seemingly shielded defense with interest, then subtly glanced at Toji. Unlike the riotous Sumiki and Megumi, Toji was quiet. His face remained expressionless as usual, not showing much anger. But Zoro knew. He's thinking of killing. The expressionless face was an instinct to hide his fierce hostility from an opponent marked for death. Showing anger or murderous intent would make the target wary. As evidence, Toji's heartbeat became slower and slower, like a person in calm meditation, despite the situation making it impossible. It's a controlled physical reaction. Doesn't seem conscious maybe an instinct. When the opponent, not sensing any murderous intent from Toji's nonverbal reactions, let the guard down. That's when he would draw his weapon and strike a vital spot in one blow. Be it the head, the neck, or the heart. As expected, father is more of a killer than a swordsman. He didn't seem to care much about the tool or method as long as he could kill. This was evident from sparring sessions where he wouldn't stick to one type of weapon but would choose whatever was most efficient at the moment. Behind that expressionless face, hundreds thousands of plans to kill Goho Satoru without harming his family must have been flickering into existence and then disappearing. Not to hold back from killing, but to select the plan with the highest chance of success. He usually doesn't show such a demeanor in front of us, preferring to be discreet. But it seemed like he wasn't in the state of mind to care about that now. The only thought dominating Toji's mind was murder is visible to Zoro. Zoro extended his hand towards Toji. Normally, Toji would have reacted immediately. But this time he was a bit slow to look at Zoro. It didn't matter. He looked this way, after all. Toji, the sword. Toji made an indescribable expression for a moment, then threw the sheathed Wado Chimonji, which had been leaning against the hospital wall, to Zoro. Zoro stood up from the bed and caught it, 
Still blocking Megumi's kicks with his Mugen, Satoru looked at the scene with an interested expression. Going to fight. Haven't decided yet. Swinging a sword overwhelmed by emotions, could lead to cutting what shouldn't be cut. Nor was he so magnanimous as to let pass what needed cutting. Unlike a few days ago, Toji was now by Zoro's side. If one of them protected Megumi and Tsumiki and the other fought, there would definitely be a chance of winning against Goho Satoru. For now, Zoro remained neutral. Whether to draw the sword or not would depend on what Goho Satoru said next. One thing at a time. Start from the beginning. What you just said, what does it mean? Goho Satoru looked at Zoro for a moment, then pushed away the pouting Megumi's cheek, pulled a chair closer, and sat down. Remember when I visited your house? Yes. At that time, I used the power of the Goho family to investigate the dispatch records of Tokyo Metropolitan Curse Technical College. Based on that, I found a suitable location for your family. Because such strong entities wouldn't leave nearby curses alone. He selected a few areas in Tokyo where the population was large. But the dispatch of sorcerers was suspiciously low in recent years. Then, sorcerers from the Goho family were dispatched to those selected areas. And Satoru personally scoured the most promising locations. Not everyone we met at Weno Zoo was from Tokyo. So it was almost like a gamble. Nonetheless, that plan was spectacularly successful. And Satoru was able to meet Zoro's family. He also found out they were using the Zenin surname. But, that information was part to the head priest by someone from my family. Everything from the fact that Goho had gone to visit them, the location of their home, to brief personal information about Zoro's family. Who received it? As I said, the head priest who harbors some resentment towards the Zenin family. His sister was almost sold into marriage to someone from the Zenin family. Where she died. Or something like that, Goho muttered in a dry voice. He diverted some nearby protective charms, and used them to gather curses. Toji laughed with a choked sound. So, because our information leaks and the head priest with a grudge against the Zenin targeted Zoro, this whole thing was orchestrated. That's how it seems. Do you believe that? Goho Satoru scoffed. Of course not. It's not a game a mere grade 2 head priest can play. However, further investigation was difficult. Since a person from the Goho family was involved, there was suspicion that the Goho family had orchestrated and tried to cover up the incident. Indeed, the Zenin family was hopping mad, accusing the Goho family of trying to assassinate their young and talented kin. Before, they didn't even know of their existence. But as soon as they learned that a special grade curse was defeated, they started ranting about their talented kin, which was quite hypocritical. Zoro frowned. Zenin, Zenin. That name crops up in everything they do. It was inevitable since Zoro, Toji, and Megumi bore that surname. Goho, Zenin, Kamo, and many other old folks from the upper echelons are clamoring to see you. The official reason is to investigate the unregistered special grade curse that appeared that day. But the real intent is likely to probe whether you're a sorcerer and what your techniques are. Of course, Zoro wasn't a sorcerer. Despite hopes raised by the news of defeating a special grade curse, the amount of cursed energy Zoro exhibited was as minuscule as any non-sorcerer's. It does seem like he leaks less cursed energy for a non-sorcerer. Despite Goho's words being infuriating, Zoro's cursed energy didn't leak out at all. Either he controls his emotions well, or he doesn't feel them strongly to begin with. Both were common among sorcerers. Megumi, who had been vigorously trying to hit Satori covered by Mugen, gasped for breath and scurried back to his brother's side, wearing a dejected expression. I couldn't hit him, it's okay. Zoro stroked Megumi's hair and hid him behind Toji. Megumi quietly retreated behind Toji's legs, but still sneakily glanced at Zoro. Goho tilted his head, observing. He's the restraining type. It was somewhat disappointing. Zoro won't meet them. Toji stepped forward in front of Zoro, shielding him behind his back, and declared in a cold voice. I have no intention of letting him meet them. Never. The aversion, misunderstanding, and malice he had suffered throughout his childhood, he had no intention of exposing Zoro to that. Goho tilted his head at Toji's dry statement. But you'll have to explain at some point, won't you? If you don't want to be treated like that head priest, either you or the kid, one of you has to go. Why don't you go and explain then? What are you doing with those good eyes of yours? That's bothersome normally. He would have replied with a flippant, Ha, huh, why should I? I don't want to. But the situation was different now. A member of the Goho family had caused trouble for them first, and technically, the cause of the incident traced back to Satoru recklessly seeking them out. Satoru ruffled his hair, recalling a conversation he once had with Suguru. If I've done something wrong, of course, I should apologize, Satoru. And then take actions to make amends. HMPH, like that makes the mistake disappear. That's not it. But there's a big difference between someone who apologizes and reflects on their wrongdoing and someone who doesn't. Recognizing one's fault is the first step to not repeating that mistake. You once threw a repenting head priest to the side as well. Caring for the weak is tiresome. But it's not like you can completely ignore them either. These folks aren't exactly the weak either. I'll help out this one time. Goho Satori decided to make an exception this time. Though the thought of facing those rotten oranges made his face scrunch up already. 
But I can't stop anything regarding Tenjin. He's too influential. Zoro looked at Toji. It seems like there are a lot of things I don't know. You don't need to worry about it. I'll take care of everything. Zoro had done his part by defending Tsumiki and Megumi against the special grade curse and getting up safely. Once Goho tells them Zoro is a non-sorcerer and Toji makes a scene, the things those people spew will change. Whether it's the upper echelons or the Zenin. Once those folks change their tune, then it'll be okay to tell Zoro. Now it's Toji's turn to step up. Don't do anything rash. And you'll want to talk. Toji pressed down on Zoro's head. Please be more careful with yourself will you? Zoro was about to retort, but swallowed his words upon hearing Toji's voice shaking with unease. Can you leave us and go by yourself? Toji hesitated. He couldn't take the kids with him. He couldn't show his children what he did as a sorcerer killer. But leaving them behind wasn't an option either, especially right after all the chaos that ensued the last time he was briefly away from them. Even within the Tokyo Metropolitan Curse Technical College's barriers, where there may not be curses but plenty of sorcerers, and it's hard to say the college is an ally. Toji glanced at Goho Satoru. Still, he wanted to kill him. But it was also true that, in the current situation, he was the one from whom the most could be extracted. Toji's target wasn't just to nip the tail of this incident, he had to find the real mastermind behind it. It's definitely not that simple incident Goho mentioned. An attack due to a grudge against the Zenin clan. Impossible. There must be someone bigger behind this. Though Toji was a non-sorcerer with zero cursed energy. He was not ignorant about curses. The charm he found in Zoro's dance was clearly one of the special grade cursed object Sukuna's fingers. There's no way a mere head priest could have orchestrated its theft alone. To find and deal with that real mastermind, Toji had to cooperate with the young master of the Goho clan. Annoyingly, let's make a binding vow. Ha! Huh. To protect our kids until I return to the Metropolitan Curse Technical College. In return, I'll place a binding vow not to hold the Goho clan responsible for this matter. Given the Goho clan's admiration for their young master, any trader who falls out of his favor won't die a peaceful death. With the sorcerer community's eyes on this matter, handling Goho Satoru now could make Toji a target in the sorcerer world. Then, it's better to leave the handling of the Goho clan and the upper echelons to the young master. That way, Toji could go after the real mastermind. Goho Satoru lifted his sunglasses to reveal his six eyes. Why should I accept your proposal? Don't accept it then. It's your loss, not mine, brat. Then he could just kill the young master, the upper echelons, and the Zenin clan. It might take more time and effort, but Toji was confident he could do it. Afterward, he could take the kids and flee overseas, or something. Having crossed Toji after touching Zoro, there was no line they shouldn't have crossed in his eyes. Goho stuck out his lips. I feel like I'm at a loss here. You'd do well to listen to dad, Zoro advised quietly. If it were merely blind rage, it might have been different. But right now, Toji was coldly and rationally planning to kill everyone involved in this case based on cold logic. If the vow, or whatever it was, wasn't accepted, the white-haired guy in front of him would end up the same way. Unless I stop him. But it was clear blood would be spilled otherwise. And Zoro had no intention of stopping him. There was no reason to protect those who attacked him and his family. Goho instinctively rubbed his neck, feeling a prick. What was that feeling just now? Alright? Lucky him, Zoro thought to himself. That guy just dodged death. So, I'll protect these three until you return, and you won't touch any Goho clan members or property as long as the condition is met. Is that the deal? Yeah. Be ready if you break it. As if I'm stupid enough to break a vow made with someone else. Goho grumbled. Breaking a vow made on one's own ability just ends with the loss of the boosted effect from the vow. But breaking a vow made with someone else doesn't end so comfortably. Because you never know what you might lose, a vow made with someone else must absolutely be kept. As soon as the vow was made, Toji turned towards Zoro. Don't go anywhere from here. Stay with the kids. Answer the phone if I call. Where are you going, Papa? There are some things I need to stomp on. What does stomp on mean, mister? At Sumiki's innocent question, Zoro answered instead. Beat them up? Ah, beat them up? Yeah. It wasn't really something that could be summed up with beat them up. Zoro looked intently at Toji. Don't get hurt. I won't. Don't get too carried away. It's those guys who need to. I'm not worried about them. I'm worried about dad. Rampaging swallowed by murderous intent might lead to regret once that murderous intent fades. Zoro glared. Don't run away again. If he dared say something like I don't belong with you or the young master will be fine without me and didn't return, he wouldn't let it slide. Toji grasped Zoro's hand tightly. I will come back. It was different now. He had people to kill and wrongs to right, so leaving was just temporary. His place was here. Besides, if he pulled that kind of stunt again, he was pretty sure either his arm or leg would end up broken by Zoro's hand upon his return. Toji hugged Zoro, Sumiki, and Megumi each in turn, then left the Metropolitan Curse Technical College like the wind. This was the beginning of what would later be called the Sorcerer Killer's Great Purge of the Sorcerer Community. Covered in blood, the Sorcerer Tamami Yoshihiro frantically fled down an alleyway. Damn it, damn it all. Tamami muttered curses under his breath, 
How had it come to this? How had he, the leader of the invincible group of sorcerers known as the Undefeated, ended up like this? The sorcerer killer he gritted his teeth in anger. A few days ago, an anonymous post appeared on the dark web, a place frequented by sorcerers. Ash seeking information on the special grade spirit incident at Tokyo Eomlaut Eomlaut department store on October 6, 2005. Reward. 3 million yen. 3 million yen for just one piece of information, not even asking someone to kill. It was an offer that any fledgling sorcerer would be tempted by. However, the reason behind seeking information about that incident and who was behind it remained unclear, making it a dubious request. Tamami Yoshihiro and his group, the Undefeated, claimed no knowledge of the incident and thus ignored it. I should have bound them with a vow not to lie. Tamami Yoshihiro only realized his brother, Tamami Yuahiro had lied to him after the sorcerer killer slaughtered dozens of sorcerers and destroyed two sorcerer communities. The sorcerer killer, a legendary figure in their world, never failing, leaving no trace, and never letting unnecessary emotions interfere with his work. That's why he hardly moved for small change. There had been rumors of his retirement yet here he was, actively hunting sorcerers. Why, if not for a contract? Yoshihiro found out the reason after some digging. The sorcerer killer's son was involved in the department store incident. Damn, I hadn't even heard the sorcerer killer had a son. Since when did any sorcerer care so tenderly for their son? But the sorcerer killer did. He posted a large bounty for information about the department store incident based on the information from sorcerer who responded and began hunting down those who lied to pinpoint the real culprit. As he got closer to the undefeated, the truth began to unravel. After the sorcerer killer almost reached the undefeated's hideout, Yuahiro confessed, shaking with fear. He had diverted a protective charm, Shukuna's finger, from its original place and handed it to someone else likely causing the special grade spirit at the department store. Yoshihiro felt like he was going insane. If he had known, he would have handed his brother over to the sorcerer killer, family or not. But now the enemy was at their doorstep, and despite Yuahiro being a thick head, he was a core part of the undefeated's force. It was too late to expel him now. There were only two sorcerers of grade 2 or higher in the undefeated, Yoshihiro and Yuahiro. But they had a large number of affiliated sorcerers, totaling 26. So, they thought they had a fighting chance. How terribly they had miscalculated. With the first swing of his chain, to which something white was attached at incredible speeds, nearly half of the undefeated sorcerers were decapitated. By the second, only Yuahiro and Yoshihiro were left standing. Between the black chains flying towards him, Yoshihiro caught the sorcerer killer's eye. The sorcerer killer, whose son was rumored to be involved in the incident and out of his mind, didn't appear angry or excited. Instead, he seemed emotionless, almost bored. This made it all the more chilling. When Yuahiro screamed and charged at the sorcerer killer, Yoshihiro knew this was his only chance to escape. So, he ran. After all, it was Yuahiro who created this mess. If his death allows me to escape, then he's paid his dues. No, that still wasn't enough to cover his sins. He had single-handedly destroyed what he had built and maintained with the undefeated. Clang. Something flew past him, and Yoshihiro hit the ground hard. You have better instincts than your brother. The dry voice made Yoshihiro's skin crawl. I thought you might have reinforcements. But it was just overconfidence that you could escape. I see no need to watch further. Realizing escape was impossible, Yoshihiro immediately prostrated himself on the ground. Please, spare me. He babbled, not fully aware of what he was saying. I know who's behind the incident. If you listen to me, you can avenge your son's death. The sorcerer killer swiftly approached, grabbed his throat, and lifted him. The previously indifferent green eyes now seemed to blaze. My son is alive and well. What? Really? But he was at the department store where the special grade spirit appeared. Struggling with this unbelievable truth, Yoshihiro's eyes widened. The sorcerer killer's scarred mouth twisted into a smirk. Who said he was dead? Yoshihiro clenched his teeth, caught in his lie. He knew the sorcerer killer must have realized he knew nothing. He had wanted to keep this card until the very end. As the grip around his throat tightened, he rolled his eyes in desperation. Behind me is the ugh upper echelon's crack. Toji simply snapped his neck, ending his life effortlessly. Then, he casually dropped the body. Do you think you're the only one who said that? Anyway, it's all rotten to the core. Toji clicked his tongue. You've made quite a mess. Turning at the sound of Shu Kong's voice, Toji saw him grumbling and approaching. Have you suddenly become a crusader of justice? Or did you belatedly discover the thrill of murder? Do you know how many sorcerer heads you've taken these past few days? There are already three sorcerer communities you've destroyed because of you. You know that. I know. And knowing that, you still made such a big deal sigh. Shu Kong stopped mid-sentence, discarded his nearly finished cigarette, and lit a new one. With the fresh nicotine hit, he seemed to calm down, speaking in a more composed voice. Have you completely given up on returning, planning to become a sorcerer? Me. They wouldn't accept a monkey with absolutely no sorceress power. Toji's only goal was to annihilate the culprits involved in Zoro's incident, whether they were non-sorcerers, sorcerers, or sorcerer killers. 
It just so happened that most of the suspects were sorcerer killers. The few non-sorcerers involved had already been handed over to the police. I'm not interested in other sorcerer killers. He didn't have a noble intention to eradicate all sorcerer killers on this occasion. The reason he ended up dealing with so many sorcerer killers was that the suspects often belonged to sorcerer killer groups. If they had handed over the problematic members easily, it wouldn't have come to this. They chose to fight together instead of surrendering their problematic members, so he simply sent them all to the afterlife. Yet, despite causing an unprecedented situation in the sorcerer world by destroying three sorcerer killer groups, he still hadn't caught even a hint of the mastermind behind everything. It's as if they don't really exist. No one had seen him directly. Those who acted had only been requested or asked by someone else. They were all tells, the head had vanished like smoke. In that case, he needed to send a warning, even if it was just to the tails. If there's anyone with a brain, they would have understood by now. Whether they understood or not, it was a lesson about what happens to those who dare to meddle in affairs involving his son. Xu Kong, witnessing the faint madness swelling in Toji's green eyes, pressed a hand to his forehead. This guy's lost it, totally lost it. This incident won't be ignored by the higher-ups either. It's only the sorcerer killers I've killed. The non-sorcerers have been handed over to the police nicely. The higher-ups had a certain level of awareness of the activities of the sorcerer killers but had tolerated them until now. The reason was simple. There's a lack of manpower. After the birth of Goho Satoru, the explosive increase in curses had driven the already few sorcerers into extreme overwork, naturally leading to an increase in deaths and desertions. As a result, the higher-ups were too busy dealing with curses and lacked the strength to track down and punish the well-hidden sorcerer killers. Since sorcerer killers also kill curses, they were seen as a necessary evil and were overlooked. But they are humans, not curses. If the higher-ups do step in, it would probably be because the tribute money from the sorcerer killers stopped, not for that reason. Some among the higher-ups accepted tributes in the form of cursed objects, tools, or money in exchange for turning a blind eye to their existence. The three sorcerer killer communities that Toji had dismantled had all been paying tributes to the higher-ups. There was no direct evidence, but circumstantial evidence was plenty. This incident is a monumental one, creating a special grade curse in a department store in broad daylight in Tokyo. It's way beyond what the higher-ups can overlook. Even if they wanted to protect them, they couldn't. After all, they were sorcerer killers, and the incident was too big. By now, the old fogies must be keeping their mouths shut and suffering from stomach aches. Their under-the-table income must have stopped. Oh right, what about that woman? Xu Kong pointed behind him. Toji noticed a woman trembling behind Xu Kong. Although she had deserted due to the chronic overwork in the sorcery world, she hadn't committed any serious wrongdoing, and was the only informer among the whistleblowers who provided useful information to Toji. After a brief consideration, Toji waved dismissively at the woman. She bowed politely and quickly left the scene. She had already received her reward of 3 million yen and even more, planning to leave Tokyo forever. She plans to stay away from the sorcery world and live in the countryside raising cats or something. He had a hunch that if he ever encountered her again while she was still a sorcerer killer, she wouldn't die a peaceful death. Watching the woman scurry away, Toji pulled out his mobile phone. It had been two hours since his last call. It was about time to call Zoro. Toji pressed the buttons firmly. After a brief ring, Zoro's voice came through the phone. Dad, what are you doing? I was sleeping. Yawning sounds from Zoro could be heard. Zoro tended to have short nights but long naps during the day. He spent most of his time either training, playing with the kids, or sleeping. Toji had tried to change this habit, claiming it was bad for health but failed. Where are Megumi and Sumiki? They're playing. Right now, they're playing tag wait, Megumi. Don't run on the stairs. Who told you to run there? You'll get in trouble. Did they fall? No, that didn't happen. As long as I'm here, it won't happen. Listen, Megumi. You absolutely, absolutely must not run on the stairs. Sumiki, you too. Got it. The sternness in Zoro's voice was followed by Megumi's whimpering apologies. You're strict. Things that aren't allowed need to be said as such. Zoro's voice trembled as he added that stairs are dangerous. Anything happen? Nothing. Is Goho guy around? No. Toji's eyebrows raised. He wondered if the promise of protection had been broken, but that didn't seem to be the case. Where did he go? He said he's going to the higher ups. Instead, that person with the bangs is here. So he's with that cursed sorcerer. It seems Goho went to report to the higher-ups that Zoro is a non-sorcerer. It's good timing. The old folks' faces should be seen at least once. Among them, there might be someone involved in this case, probably panicking right now. I'll be there soon. Bring back some ginger tea when you come. Got it. Toji ended the call. It was time to face a long-standing adversary. At that time, Goho Satoru was feeling like he was shouting at a wall. Ah. How many times do I have to say it? He's a non-sorcerer, a non-sorcerer. Despite repeatedly explaining since his arrival, those damned rotten old folks, 
who seemed to have decided not to use their ears anymore, refused to listen to him. An elder from the higher-ups, hidden behind a long draped cloth, retorted sharply, How can a five-year-old non-sorcerer exorcise a special grade curse? If that were possible, there would be no need for sorcerers at all. He must be a sorcerer, or he has some special curse object or tool. As the others echoed in agreement, Satoru seriously considered his options. Should I hit them? Would they die if he did? Maybe getting rid of these rotten old folks quickly is actually for the betterment of the sorcerer community. Alright, Satoru will step up for the sake of the sorcerer community. Ah, would Yaga sensei scold me? No, he'd probably give me a thumbs up if he saw this. Shoko too, of course, Suguru as well. Maybe not. Satoru decided to hold back just one more time, and ruffled his hair. Hey, are you all senile? Do you not know what my eyes can do? Satoru lowered his sunglasses. The higher-ups shut their mouths upon seeing the brilliantly shining six eyes. The six eyes that the Goho clan had finally been blessed with after 400 years of waiting. There was no way those eyes could miss anything sorcerous. I've seen it with my own eyes. He's a non-sorcerer. The weapons he uses aren't cursed tools either. A silence filled with disbelief and doubt followed. If what you say is true, that's a problem in its own right, Goho Satoru. The calm voice made Goho turn around. Hidden behind the cloth, he immediately recognized who sat there by the bald head, astonishingly long gray eyebrows, and beard. It was Gakuganji Yoshinobu, the principal of the Kyoto Sorcery School. A mere five-year-old has single-handedly defeated a special grade curse. In history, the only being capable of such a feat was Ryo and Sukuna. Even Goho Satoru, born with both the Six Eyes and the Limitless, hadn't been able to achieve that at such a young age. Considering that Ryo and Sukuna, despite being a cursed user, was treated as a being close to a natural disaster, Sorrow too might grow into a being with similar powers in the not-too-distant future. If he achieved this without any sorcerous power, then that's terrifying in its own way. It means a new power has emerged that we neither know of nor can control. Goho Satori cleared his throat and took off his sunglasses. So, what, you're suggesting we get rid of him? Wasn't that a fundamental virtue of sorcerers to protect non-sorcerers, old man? Like it or not, it's a sorcerer's duty to protect non-sorcerers. The moment they shirk this responsibility, they become no better than curse users. Regardless of his personal feelings about the rule, Satoru was well aware of this fact. Gakuganji spoke smoothly, unobstructed. If he is a non-sorcerer, then so be it. However, the blind spot here is that we don't know what he really is. It's possible that he's a curse capable of deceiving even the six eyes with some high level curse technique. Or he could be a completely new type of being. Goho Satoru. You said you saw him as a non-sorcerer with your six eyes. But you also know that a non-sorcerer cannot exorcise a special grade curse. Can you clearly tell us what he is? Goho Satori thought about Zoro, whom he had observed at the academy over the past few days. Sleeping anywhere he lays his head, waking up instantly when his siblings are around. Always playing with his siblings, strictly scolding them when they do something they shouldn't. Diligently feeding the kids, clinging to his siblings like a cola to a tree, walking around clumsily, lifting heavy rocks even with the kids sitting on top, then standing up. If you take your eyes off him for a moment, he's off somewhere else, usually brought back by his younger sister. Answering his father's calls immediately, whether he's eating, sleeping, or training. When he's taking care of his sword, he's more meticulous than anyone. Just as Goho Satoru was about to answer Gakuganji's question, the door opened with a slide. At the serious moment, an elder from the higher-ups yelled out, annoyed. Who the hell is? It's me. Behind the door, Toji Zenin appeared, holding a large sword. A gasp was heard from a corner, and someone stood up abruptly. It was an elder from the Zenin clan. With trembling fingers, he pointed at Toji. You, Toji, how dare you come here? Why not? It's about my son. What? What? Didn't you hear? You old man, so lazy. Goho took a moment to observe Toji. The smell of blood was strong, but there wasn't a single drop on his clothes or body. Spotlessly clean compared to the large sword he held, dripping with blood. Goho looked past the open door, where dozens of sorcerers lay on the ground. Despite everything, these were the higher-ups. The level of sorcerers tasked with their protection was undeniably high. It's just that this gorilla is off the charts. Did you kill them all? With those eyes and you ask. I just knocked them out. Ugh, that's even more disturbing. The ones lying down there wouldn't think so. After all, living is preferable to the alternative. Toji stepped into the room with large strides, causing the Zenin clan elder to erupt in anger. Get out. Leave at once. How dare someone like you don't fuss. I don't like seeing your face either. Another higher up murmured in surprise. There should have been a barrier. How did he? Well, I have a peculiar constitution. Toji wasn't here to talk about himself, so he didn't plan on elaborating. It seems you were discussing my son just now. Why don't you enlighten me? Silence fell. The higher-ups, now mood as if they had eaten honey, 
didn't utter a sound. They couldn't. The pressure and murderous intent Toji exuded were that intense. Especially the Zenin elder buried in the fear from the day of Toji's past assault could only tremble. Toji hummed and then spoke leisurely. Then let me start the conversation. Today, I destroyed three curse user communities related to the incident where my son encountered a special grade curse at the department store. Tokyo Sorcery Association, Q, and Invincible. And I found quite interesting stuff. Hearing the names of the organizations, there were twitchy reactions from around. The only one who didn't move was Gakuganji. You monkey, what are you trying to say? It seems like it'd be easier for you to make decisions if you knew. The fact that the curse user communities had been bribing the higher-ups was circumstantial evidence. Toji also had no direct evidence, but the higher-ups didn't know that. So, just hinting at it is enough. Reveal that you have something on them, but not what it exactly is. Making them anxious about how much Toji knows, so they squirm and protect themselves. Toji sheathed his blood-soaked sword back into the curse's mouth, disarming himself. Yet, even unarmed, the higher-up sorcerers dared not attack him. They knew it would be a losing battle. That fact instinctively popped into their heads. Toji declared coldly, Zoro is a non-sorcerer. Do you understand what that means? He's not within your reach to meddle with. Sorcerers should not antagonize non-sorcerers. It's a principle compulsively taught within the sorcery community. Yet, the high ups repeatedly crossed that line. Toji was warning them about this. Gakuganji opened his mouth to speak. Do you truly believe that? Toji and Goho turned towards the voice. Can you assert that he is merely a non-sorcerer, your son, even after witnessing power and anomalies never reported in history? Toji looked pensively at Gakuganji. Of course, Zoro was significantly different from an ordinary non-sorcerer. He knew things he shouldn't spoke of experiences he couldn't have had. Zoro wielded the Wado Ichimonji, as if he had been practicing for decades, a gift from Toji on his fifth birthday. Sometimes, Zoro hinted at having trained in Haki for years, which was impossible considering his age. Zoro's combat experience was excessively vast, as if he had been through war or large-scale battles multiple times. Zoro detested when Megumi or Tsumiki ran on the stairs, as if he knew someone who had suffered greatly from such an act. It was different from merely being mature or strong. There were too many questions, none of which Toji had satisfactorily resolved. Buy some ginger tea on your way back. Yet, when he thought of Zoro, who asked for ginger tea for ginger-loving Megumi, none of that seemed to matter. He is human, a non-sorcerer, and my son. Toji was certain of that much. Therefore, nothing else mattered. Toji indifferently regarded the higher-ups. Killing everyone here would be easy, but eliminating them would only replace them with other trash. It was cheaper to leave them be and threaten them. If you pull something like this again, you'll find yourself an enemy of me. Toji turned and left without hesitation. There was still unfinished business he planned to settle before returning to the Jujutsu High School. The higher-ups dared not stop or detain Toji. Only Goho casually yelled at Toji's retreating back. Hey, gorilla. When will you be back at the high school? Tomorrow. Tell Zoro I said hi. Toji waved offhandedly. That afternoon, the sorcery world was rocked by news of the sorcerer killer, devastating another curse user organization. The sorcery world was turned upside down. The sorcerer killer's rampage resulted in the dissolution of four curse user organizations, and even independent curse users were wiped out. The higher-ups were in trouble, trying to handle the aftermath away from the eyes of non-sorcerers, dealing with police and media to keep things quiet. However, the Tokyo Jujutsu High, at the very center of this incident, was as peaceful as the eye of a storm. Zoro was sitting with Megumi and Sumiki asleep beside him under a falling maple tree at the school, avoiding the sunlight. The breeze was cool. Zoro liked autumn. Yamorimo. A vein popped on Zoro's forehead. From a distance, Goho Satoru approached him. Zoro gritted his teeth. Don't call me that. What's wrong with calling a Marimo, Marimo? Hey, Goho Satoru chuckled and sat down beside the sleeping Megumi. Your dad really made a spectacle, didn't he? At least in Tokyo, the curse users have dried up. Including the four curse user organizations and independent curse users, nearly 100 were killed, right? The sorcerer killer, known only by name in the shadows of the sorcery world, became a celebrity known by all within the sorcery world due to this incident. Having killed so many curse users, the nickname sorcerer killer had half shifted to curse user killer as a bonus. Even some of the higher up sorcerers declared sudden retirements and began seclusion. The official reason was old age. But Goho Satoru wasn't naive enough to take that at face value. It must be related to what the gorilla mentioned yesterday. Despite the constant talk of rotten oranges, who knew they were connected to curse user communities. Goho Satoru was cynical. Meanwhile, Toji, in keeping his promise not to meddle with the Goho family, didn't touch them. There was a sense of not giving any reason to interfere with the Goho family and the higher-ups, considering their close yet strained relations. If he hadn't made a pact with me not to touch the Goho family, 
the gorilla might have wiped out the higher-ups or the Goho family as well. Goho casually shared such information with Zoro. Listening to the disorganized information, Zoro's face remained impassive even dozing off at the end. Aren't you surprised? Not really. Zoro yawned. He had expected the culprits would be doomed once Toji took action alone. In fact, the number of curse users Toji eliminated was less than Zoro had anticipated. Only about a hundred. In his past life, it would have been thousands. It felt like a much more peaceful world compared to his previous life. Goho made a fuss. You'd think a little kid like you would go gasp. How could my dad? Scary. A murderer. And run away. Well, if one of us were to run away from the other, it'd probably be my dad rather than me. Zoro thought to himself. By now, he wasn't shocked by murder, whether he was the one killing or Toji was. It wasn't as if the world was turned upside down. It was just retribution against those who crossed Zoro. Not getting much of a reaction from Zoro. Goro crossed his arms behind his head and sprawled out his legs as he sat down. You're no fun. The people in the sorcery world are all scared, calling your dad the crazy curse user killer. Doesn't that interest you? It doesn't matter to me what people call me or my dad. Whether a good person or a bad one. He had never been swayed by such labels. Not in his past life nor in this one. Being pointed at or treated as a villain was something he had always experienced. Toji was Zoro's family, and as such, what Whatever he was called wasn't Zoro's concern. Goho tilted his head in confusion. Don't like being called a good person. It's not that. It's just that being called a good person makes my skin crawl. I'm not a hero. Not that he hated heroes. But Zoro himself didn't want to be one. Heroes are those who share their liquor with others. Why give away precious liquor? It's for him to drink. Thus, Zoro had no intention of demanding others to be heroes or good people. He wasn't one to begin with. Goho looked at Zoro for a moment before shrugging. Well... I don't mind being treated as a hero, but it's exhausting, you know. All that talk about power comes with responsibility, duty, and whatnot. I hate moralizing. Goho grumbled. Zoro glanced at him and said, you don't ignore all that either. If he really wanted to go off without any duty or responsibility, there was no need for him to form a pact with Toji about bindings and such. He could have just watched Toji sweep everything away, whether it involved the Goho family or anything else. The fact that he didn't meant he was taking on at least some responsibility as the head of the Goho family. Even now, look, despite talking about fun, Marimo and Watnut Goho Satoru has been quite diligently by their side while Toji was away. And when he unavoidably had to leave, he entrusted their protection to Jito Suguru. Goho Satoru declared arrogantly, well, that's because I'm the strongest. The talk of duty and responsibility might be bothersome, but he could bear a little. After all, with the power he possessed, he could easily carry such responsibilities. You too, right? None of the non-sorcerers present at the scene where you dealt with the special grade curse died. Is that so? At the time, he might have been so focused on the curse that he didn't notice. If people survived, that's not a bad thing. Zoro stopped his thoughts there. If someone other than your sibling had been attacked by that curse, would you have just watched? No. Huh. Is that a sense of morality? A sense of justice? It's because it feels wrong. Women, children, civilians, or anyone in a weakened state unable to fight back. Leaving such people to die just leaves a bad taste. That was the only reason. To avoid feeling uncomfortable. It wasn't out of some noble intent to save lives. Goho Satoru looked intently at Zoro. He could have dressed up his intentions a bit, but he bluntly said it was because it feels wrong. It proved he didn't care in the slightest how others saw him. You're crazy. Ah, that's a compliment. After all, all sorcerers are pretty crazy. Satoru circled his temple with his index finger. Shito approached Goho's side. Satoru, it's not nice to tease a child. Shem PH, I don't like it. This kid is totally crazy. I'll apologize on his behalf then. Zoro, it's just how Satoru is. What's that supposed to mean? Amid the bickering, Zoro suddenly turned his head, far away. He saw Toji approaching. In the blink of an eye, Toji was right in front of them, embracing the three children. Zoro naturally wrapped his arms around Toji's back in return. Half asleep Megumi and Sumiki, not fully grasping the situation, slightly opened their eyes before falling back asleep. Zoro distanced himself from Toji and asked, Are you hurt anywhere? No. I heard you made quite the scene. Who told you that? Quick to find the culprit, Toji glared fiercely at Satoru. Hey, what are you going to do about it? Gorilla, want to go around? Do you know who took good care of your Marimo? Marimo? Yeah, that thing. It was a bit different from a tennis ball. What was it right, Marimo? Zoro saw Toji's body subtly shaking with suppressed laughter and gritted his teeth. Don't laugh. So, a uh, Marimo, you've been good. Are you going to call me that too? Toji chuckled at Zoro's angry retort. Is everything taken care of? For now, not knowing how deeply the Goho family and the upper echelons were connected, Toji didn't directly interfere with the upper echelons, just lightly threatened them. But everything else was dealt with. It wasn't that he lacked the power to sweep away the upper echelons. There was also the pact not to touch the Goho family, and handling the aftermath would have been too bothersome. If the upper echelons were completely swept away, the sorcery headquarters would collapse. 
and the collapse of the headquarters would mean the collapse of the sorcery world. All sorcerer assignments and compensations are managed through the headquarters. Although the higher-ups are corrupt to the core, the sorcery headquarters, along with the Ainu Sorcery Union, is one of only two sorcerer organizations supported by the Japanese government. If such places were to disappear overnight, the world would plunge into chaos. It goes without saying that Toji would be treated as a traitor. At least, not in Japan. That wasn't the outcome Toji wanted. It would be hard for the kids to move to another country at such a young age and adapt. You did well. Toji felt something catch in his throat at Zoro's simply offered words. He couldn't bring himself to say it was nothing. Don't get hurt, son. If something went wrong with you, this time, I really wouldn't be able to come back. Toji embraced Zoro as if clinging to him. Zoro, accustomed to it, patted Toji's back. Satoru watched the scene and made a retching noise. The father and son are both crazy. Ha, huh, Satoru. Chito Suguri shook his head in disbelief. Even with summer over and heat exhaustion unlikely, he wondered when that guy would ever become sensible. After Toji's purge of the curse users, the upper echelons engaged in intense debates for a while. Initially focused on uncovering Zoro's identity and attempting to recruit him, the upper echelon's attention shifted towards Toji, after he wiped out four curse user organizations. Discussions ranged from officially registering Toji as a sorcerer, and assigning him a rank and duties, to objections about how to rank someone without any cursed energy and even absurd suggestions to label him a curse user and eliminate him. After days of fruitless debate, the upper echelons decided to postpone any decisions. This included postponing Zoro's enrollment in the Tokyo Sorcery High, protecting Zoro at the school until he was of age to enroll, and determining any actions or rankings for Toji. However, they couldn't just leave Zoro and Toji alone. So they arranged for someone affiliated with the Tokyo Sorcery High to meet them once a week and prepare a report. It was essentially outsourcing their surveillance of Toji and Zoro to the school. Both the school and Toji's family found this decision frustrating. Ah, it's so warm. Goho Satoru squeezed his lengthy body under the katatsu, leaving only his head peeking out as he lounged around. The problem was that this was Toji's house, and the katatsu was newly set up by Toji that day. Wrapped in the blanket, Goho said, I'm not leaving here. You go to the mission alone, Suguru. Satoru, that's not yours. Plus, this is someone else's house, you know. Get up already. No way. Toji thought to himself that he should have eliminated Goho and the others back then, as he watched Goho wriggle under the katatsu like a bug. Megumi looked around Goho curiously before asking his family, why is Satoru like that? Maybe he likes warm places, Megumi. Because he's stupid. Because he hasn't been hit enough. Do you think I'm doing this because I want to? I'm on a mission. Goho retorted, head still raised while his body remained hidden under the katatsu. After hearing the successive comments from Tsumiki, Zoro, and Toji. You seem to be enjoying it too much for that, Satoru. Shito remarked dryly. While it was true they were visiting Toji's house as part of their duty to keep an eye on him and Zoro, Satoru's behavior hardly matched the mission's seriousness. Toji decided it was time to get rid of it. He stood up and wrapped Goho Satoru in the katatsu, lifting it all together. Then he kicked open the window. Wait enough, get lost. Toji threw Goho far away. There was a thud followed by the sound of the katatsu breaking apart. Goho would have surrounded himself with an infinity barrier if he hadn't, then it's his own stupidity. Sumiki muttered as she watched the blanket and table fly away. That was just taken out of the storeroom. Anything he's used shouldn't be used. It's infectious. Toji slowly patted Sumiki's head and spoke to Jito Suguru. Get lost too, forehead. I can't do that. While it's true Satoru was wrong, our mission is to observe you and Zoro. The broken Kitatsu will be compensated for by Satoru. Saying this, Jito smiled gently. Toji narrowed his eyes. The tone was polite, but the message was clear he wasn't leaving. This one's a sorcerer too. Young and doesn't know the value of his own life. Feeling like he's watching a puppy act tough, Toji bared his teeth in amusement. It's typical for young, talented sorcerers to be arrogant. But they shouldn't be in front of Toji. It would be better for you to leave while talking nicely. I've finished talking with your homeroom teacher. For one hour a week, for three hours, Toji and Zoro come to the Tokyo Sorcery High. They don't perform any missions or work. They literally just show up at the school and then leave. The school, in turn, pays Toji for this time. And if they spend more time at the school, they receive additional compensation. Between the upper echelons, who ordered the surveillance of Zoro and Toji, and Toji, who didn't want the school's sorcerers at his house. This was a compromise found by Yaga Masamichi. It seemed these two were unaware of the deal between Yaga and Toji. If they knew, they wouldn't have come over so freely on the pretext of a mission. Toji recalled the very polite, large sorcerer who was in charge of these two. Not a stupid one, and quite a decent teacher. Without Yaga's proposition, these two might not have been of this world by now. Noise came from the direction of the entrance. Finally here, a polite knock was heard, and Toji went to open the door. There stood Goho Satoru with a bump on his head and Yaga Masamichi. Yaga silently bowed his head in front of Toji. Suguru, come out. Your mission is over. Hey, yes. Satoru, you better apologize now. No bang. Ah, 
After adding another bump on top of Goho's existing one, Yaga grabbed Satoru's head and made him bow simultaneously, bowing respectfully himself. The students have caused a significant inconvenience. It's my fault for not conveying the mission properly. I am truly ashamed. It's also a hassle on our end to see blood in front of the kids. If they'd just take them away quickly, that'd be welcome. Toji waved his hand dismissively. This matter will incur an additional charge. Understood. Then Yaga gave another relieved bow and closed the door behind him. The whines of Goho Satoru could be heard from behind the closed door. But that was none of Toji's concern. Zoro, seeing Toji return with a look of relief, commented, You restrained yourself well. I refuse free labor, no, that's not it. Toji had almost carelessly mentioned refusing to work for free but stopped himself, realizing it wasn't something to say in front of his son, despite Zoro being aware of Toji's killer activities. You seem to have held back quite a bit for you. Any reason? If sorcerers decrease too much, it'd be troublesome. While Zoro and Toji might be exceptions, Megumi is almost certain to work in the sorcery field. Already, by wiping out the curse users, the manpower to handle curses has drastically decreased. If the strongest two were also eliminated, the gap in sorcery manpower would become enormous. Those guys need to stay alive to beat down curses. Otherwise, all the increased and strengthened curses since Goho Satoru's birth might all fall to Megumi to handle, or Zoro and Toji might have to take care of it themselves. Otherwise, curses that had been quiet during Goho Satoru's life might start rampaging, and before Megumi's generation even begins to act, the sorcery world could collapse, leaving non-sorcerers to suffer at the hands of curses. None of these outcomes were what Toji wanted. It's still a long way off, and he had no intention of letting it happen. Zoro's face became grim. He understood the meaning, but those guys leading the sorcery world, especially that white-haired brat, doesn't seem very proper either. Unable to argue, Toji remained silent for a moment before speaking. We'll have to fix their attitudes. How? How do you plan to fix the attitude of someone who barges into someone's home and snuggles into their katatsu like it's their own? Sensing Zoro's skepticism, Toji smiled. Don't worry, I have the perfect way. If they get beaten up, they'll listen. While they don't seem to understand human language, the primitive language of fists they will comprehend. Getting hit will also toughen them up, preventing them from recklessly relying on their techniques and getting killed. It might be better for them to stay alive even if they get beaten up. Time to relieve some stress. Toji cracked his knuckles. Toji's family was walking hand in hand. Megumi was holding Tsumiki's hand, Tsumiki was holding Zoro's hand, and Zoro was holding Toji's hand as they walked. Although the surveillance ordered by the sorcery school was for Zoro and Toji, they couldn't just leave Megumi and Tsumiki at home. So the four of them ended up going to the school together. Zoro looked at Tsumiki. By the way, Tsumiki, did you tell mom we're going here? No. Is that okay? Yes. Alright. Let me know if anything happens. Okay? After the department store incident, Sumiki ended up not going back home and stayed at Zoro's house. Sumiki's mother didn't look for her either. Ah, a dragonfly. Catch it. No Megumi. We should let the dragonfly fly. A, at least Sumiki continued to laugh with Megumi. And there was no falsehood in their laughter. Then that's enough, I guess. Since the department store incident, Sumiki and Megumi have been somewhat inseparable from Zoro's side, but it's more serious on our end. Zoro looked up at Toji. Toji kept glancing over, checking if Zoro was still by his side, making sure he was holding hands. In a few weeks, I'll be six years old in this life. Six years old is the age to start school in this world, of course. That doesn't mean they're all grown up, but still, the overprotection was excessive. If he had done the same with Megumi or Tsumiki, Zoro would have considered it natural. But, I'm different. After the battle at the department store, Zoro's body became lighter and grew much faster. It was as if a wall blocking his growth had been shattered. In other words, he became stronger. Perhaps it's because he's my father. Is it natural for a parent to protect their child? I don't know. I would have to have been someone's parent or child to know. Just because I didn't have parents in my previous life, doesn't mean there were no adults who protected young Zoro. Kashiro passed on his teachings to Zoro, and the people of Shimitsuki village gave quite a lot to Zoro, an orphan without parents, for nothing in return. A spare room, clothes that children had outgrown, a bowl of leftover rice. Thanks to that, Zoro never starved, shivered without clothes, or slept without a roof over his head. For an orphan in harsh times, Zoro thought he was pretty lucky. Yet, in Shimitsuki village, Zoro was more of a protector than a protected. After Kuina's death, at the age of 10, Zoro became the strongest person in Shimitsuki village, and protected it from pirates and bandits. No one asked him to, it just seemed natural. So, Toji's anxious gaze, worrying about where Zoro might go or if he might get hurt, still felt a bit awkward. It was the first time someone saw Zoro as a complete object of protection. Even Luffy, 
who naturally took protecting his crew for granted, never hesitated to entrust Zoro with battles. He always readily believed in Zoro and entrusted him with them, saying Zoro wouldn't lose to anyone. Battles with the leaders of opposing organizations were always Luffy's responsibility. But that was about fulfilling the captain's duties, not because Luffy doubted Zoro's strength. Toji didn't seem to think Zoro was weak either. It was just an unconditional protection. That felt a bit strange. Unable to overlook Toji's persistent gaze any longer, Zoro asked. What are you looking at? I'm worried you might get lost. We're holding hands. Still feels like you could get lost. Hey, it wasn't a joke Toji was seriously concerned. Everything else might be growing rapidly. But why not a sense of direction? Not at all, not even a little bit. Is he really a treasure with absolutely no sense of direction? That was a pretty serious issue. If he happened to encounter a spirit and experienced a distortion in space, ending up somewhere completely off, he might never be able to return. Suddenly feeling anxious, Toji cautioned him. After going somewhere, make sure not to go alone. If you end up on an unfamiliar road, call me right away. Got it. Maybe I should put a child locator necklace on you. Unable to kick Toji, Zoro just sighed. In the distance, Goho Satoru and Jito Suguru could be seen. Goho was lazily waving his hand to signal his location. Marimo, Gorilla. Oh boy, the veins on Zoro's already furrowed forehead bulged even more. Toji tapped Zoro's head gently. It was a signal to calm down for now. He would take revenge later. Jito bowed politely towards Toji. Hello, and hello to you too, Zoro. Ah, Goho Satoru looked over the four of them and commented. You brought everyone along. You can't leave the kids alone. Hum, so what? You plan to slack off here for three hours and then go home. It seemed Goho Satoru was somewhat indifferent, having heard about the arrangement from Yaga. Oh well, indifference might have been better. Toji pondered. I was planning to do just that but I've changed my mind. Ha! Huh. Shouldn't we do something worth the pay we receive? Call your teacher over. I have something to discuss. Toji's smiling face sent shivers down the spines of both Goho Satoru and Jito Suguru. Jito mumbled. What are you planning to do? You guys rely too much on jujutsu techniques. Especially you, young master. Given the overpowered nature of his limitless technique, that was to be expected. But Goho Satori can't always be wrapped in his limitless technique. Even if he has limitless, if someone who can nullify or break through limitless shows up, he's as good as dead. For example, someone like Toji with Heavenly Restriction. For a typical Jujutsu Sorcerer, even if they possess Heavenly Restriction, getting close to Goho Satori wouldn't be easy. His six eyes, which miss nothing of Jujutsu nature, would detect a Sorcerer or the nature of Heavenly Restriction from afar, and naturally be on guard. But if Toji were to confront Goho Satoru, it's a different story. With no cursed energy at all, even the six eyes would find it hard to detect him. And with his speed and extensive combat experience, the current Goho is no match. Perhaps when he grows up to reach the peak of his powers as a sorcerer, it might be a different story. If it weren't for me and Heavenly Restriction, maybe there would never be a natural enemy for that young master. Life isn't that easy. Especially after witnessing Zoro's birth and growth, Toji's thoughts have significantly changed. With a child who can defeat a special grade cursed spirit at the age of five, despite being a non-sorcerer. It's possible that in the not too distant future, a cursed spirit or cursed user that can counter his limitless technique might appear. Or another individual like Toji, without cursed energy, might be born to kill Goho Satoru. It would be troublesome if Goho dies so easily in such a scenario. His continuous work is necessary for Zoro and Megumi's ease. The same goes for that sorcerer. Relying too much on the cursed spirits he controls will lead to his quick demise. This is a good opportunity to thoroughly correct his behavior. Toji stretched with a grin on his face. I'll teach you both hand-to-hand -hand combat. Oh, no using jujutsu techniques. Okay. This is a physical training session. Goho and Jito shivered, sensing an ominous chill. When do you think a person can fly? Is it when boarding an airplane? No. Is it when using a flight technique? No. Is it when attacked by a flying cursed spirit? No. Yaga Masamichi could now definitely answer that question. A person flies when thrown by a non-sorcerer with zero cursed energy. Boom. Yaga watched with blurred vision as the giant rat cursed spirit that Suguru had recently boasted about acquiring was pulverized into dust in midair with a single punch from Toji. Initially, Yaga was also startled, but as such sights repeated, he just watched. Unlike the cursed spirits that were annihilated instantly, Gohu and Jito, though flung around and sustaining minor injuries, kept coming back for more. Then came Toji's fist kick straight into Suguru's stomach. Yueya! Struck by Toji's kick, Suguru flew swiftly and disappeared into the dense forest surrounding the school. Home run! Shoko! who was sitting nearby with a cigarette in her mouth, thought absent-mindedly upon seeing that. She frowned as she heard a thud from the middle of the forest and saw birds startled into flight. I hope he's not too hurt. After all, reversing their curse techniques to heal them would be troublesome. But considering that both Jito and Goho have been sent flying more than five times and still come charging back each time, 
It seemed Toji was somewhat managing his strength. I'd better not intervene. Shoko quickly decided. She figured she'd end up in the same state if she tried to intervene. That was the last thing she wanted. The school's open ground was now marked with craters and ash left from the annihilation of cursed spirits. What's this? A meteorite collision. Shoko kicked at one of the craters with her fault. Hey gorilla, tone it down a bit. Toji frowned at the sight of a frantically fussing Goho Satoru. It wasn't because of the fuss. It was because he was enveloped in his limitless technique. I told you not to use techniques. How am I supposed to deal with a gorilla like you without using techniques? It's physical training. Can't you understand? If you use limitless, you won't improve your physical skills. Like the sorcerer and Goho. They kept resorting to cursed techniques whenever things got a bit tough. They would unconsciously summon cursed spirits to block attacks or envelop themselves in limitless. Using cursed techniques in response to danger is a sorcerer's instinct. But that won't prepare you for situations where cursed techniques are ineffective. It would negate the purpose of all the effort Toji had put into training. Goho flopped down on the spot. Ah, forget it. I'm not doing this. I'm not. Enough with the surveillance or whatever, just leave already. Should I prick him with heavenly restriction to get him back to his senses? Toji pondered. Yaga cautiously suggested. Both of you have duties tomorrow. So it would be best to stop here. Toji clicked his tongue. He thought Goho was overreacting since he hadn't used any cursed energy or filled the three hours completely. But since there was a task tomorrow, he had to stop here. As Toji lowered his arms, Shoko quickly approached Goho and put on the sunglasses that Goho had left with her in advance. Shoko applied a reverse curse technique and only then did a relieved Goho grind his teeth. Crazy gorilla. Did you also raise your son by beating him up like this? We do spar together. Of course, Toji didn't actually hit Zoro and it was more of Zoro teaching. In fact, it was Zoro who had done the hitting, especially when practicing observation haki. Zoro would swing a black stick enveloped in armament haki at Toji's head, while he had his eyes closed, telling him to focus on the presence. Naturally, Goho, unaware of the nature of Toji and Zoro's sparring sessions, was thoroughly disgusted. Being treated like a father, you're pretty lucky. Surprisingly lenient. Toji acknowledged that the treatment he received was relatively generous compared to what he had given. Toji glanced over at where Zoro was. Zoro was leaning against a tree, soaring softly. Next to him, Megumi and Sumiki were huddled up, doing something to Zoro. It looks like they're sticking the stickers that Sumiki likes on Zoro's cheeks. Toji recalled the pink stickers adorned with cubic zirconias and glitter that Sumiki enjoyed. Zoro would be shocked when he wakes up. Shoko, sitting next to her, let out a groan as Jito walked over and flopped down beside her. Shoko, could you heal me too? I'll make an exception this time. But there won't be a next time. It's not a fault. It's that gorilla's fault. We could have just stayed put. But no, he had to go on about physical training. Goho grumbled. If we're going to spend time at the Jujutsu High, might as well make it useful for you guys. We don't need physical training, okay? were the strongest. There wasn't a hint of doubt in their confident declaration. They were limited in using their curse techniques during the fight. But if they fought with all their might, they were convinced they couldn't lose to Toji even if he was the opponent. Such arrogance. Toji chuckled. After all, it would be stranger if Goho, who had been revered from birth and had no equal, wasn't arrogant. But after fighting them, Toji knew for sure. These two can't beat me now. Unless they suddenly awaken and grow exponentially in the middle of a fight, as they are now, even Goho's limitless curse technique couldn't withstand Toji's heavenly restriction to kill him. Even the current pinnacle of the Jujutsu world couldn't stand against Toji. Realizing this, Toji briefly halted his actions. Any slight movement, and he might actually prove it, avoiding Goho's attacks while regaining his senses. There's still a long way to go. They can't stop thinking this is the ceiling. The place where Zoro will stand years from now when he has grown might be much higher than where Toji stands now. To reach that place, Toji needed an appropriate punching bag, no, an opponent. In that regard, these two sorcerers were quite fitting. Unlike Zoro, who Toji didn't feel much urge to attack, these two made him want to hit them more the more he saw them. He had to beat them without killing them, without seriously injuring them, and by deliberately showing physical moves. But those restrictions actually made Toji control his strength more delicately. I need to modify the deal. It seems he'll need to train more often than they agreed. That way, they'd quickly become accustomed to using their bodies more efficiently. It's a win-win, since their physical skills will improve much more than they are now. Thinking thoughts that would have made Jito and Goho foam at the mouth if they knew, Toji clenched and then relaxed his fist. This marked the beginning of Toji's physical training class, which would shine as the worst subject in the history of Tokyo Jujutsu High for generations to come. Zoro gently laid Toji's heavy body down in a place where no one would come. Searching Toji's body, Zoro found a cell phone and called Shu Kong. Upon seeing Toji's corpse, missing an arm, and Zoro's blood-soaked figure, Shu Kong remained silent. He was curious about how this had happened to Toji, but didn't dare ask Zoro. With eyes blazing with an emotion that could be sorrow or rage, Zoro firmly said, 
Find me a crematorium. It was more of a command than a request, but faced with Zoro's menacing aura that seemed ready to kill if disobeyed, Shu Kong didn't utter a word of protest and complied. At a quiet crematorium introduced by Shu Kong, Zoro cremated Toji. He burned the body, receiving only a small jar's worth of ashes. And then he buried those ashes next to Chiez. Zoro stared blankly at Toji's grave, which, unlike Chiez, was freshly made and clean. Now, are you satisfied? Are you happy to be beside her? Zoro swallowed these words instead of voicing them out loud. There's no use talking to the dead. No sarcasm, reprimand, or criticism would matter. It would only become a meaningless soliloquy. Xu Kong, smoking a cigarette and standing by, shook his head as he looked at Zoro's calm face. So tough. Throughout the entire process, Zoro never once cried. Not a single tear was shed. Whether it was because his affection for his father was faint, or oh, right. Xu Kong suddenly remembered something he had half forgotten because it was so long ago. That guy had left some money for times like this. He would have to combine that money with the reward for completing the growth request, and give that bank account to this kid. Zoro turned away from Toji's grave. Xu Kong, having finished his cigarette, stamped it out on the ground and said, I can give you a ride home. No need. I'll at least call you a taxi. Take that to go home. Zoro didn't refuse that offer. It was more accurate to say he wasn't in the state of mind to refuse. His head felt foggy and heavy. A storm of thoughts and emotions swelled and then heavily settled in his mind. He needed to get home quickly. Sumiki and Megumi would be waiting. But he couldn't remember the way home. I'm tired. Exhausted. Exhausted. He's not coming. Sumiki glanced at the clock. It was already past 7pm. Zoro was significantly later than his usual return time. Could it be that brother, like mom, won't come back? No, let's not think that way. Sumiki shook her head trying to dispel the sudden surge of anxiety. Click. The sound of the front door opening brightened Sumiki's face as she ran towards it. Brother. However, upon seeing Zoro's face, Sumiki couldn't help but freeze. His usual calm expression betrayed an undeniable pain. Brother. Sumiki thought it looked like Zoro was crying. No sound could be heard, no tears fell. What happened? Faced with Sumiki's question, Zoro opened his mouth, then closed it. To say that Toji had died. Or it was nothing. Or it was nothing at all. He couldn't speak any of those words. Because, the truth would hurt Sumiki. And he couldn't tell a lie. Zoro couldn't treat Toji's death as something trivial. Or as if it were nothing. Belatedly rushing over, Megumi froze upon seeing Zoro's face. It was his first time seeing his brother with such an expression. So much pain. So much struggle. As if he was about to crumble. Disperse like a shattered sugar jar. Megumi was suddenly afraid. Just like Tsumiki's mother had been. Just like their father who he could hardly remember now, had been. He feared his brother might also leave and disappear from their side. Brother, don't go. Megumi rushed into Zoro's arms. Reflexively, Zoro hugged his back. Sumiki, holding back her tears until then, also burst into tears and clung to Zoro. Their warmth filled his embrace. Zoro said nothing, just buried his face in the warmth of his siblings. Though it was Zoro who was being hugged, it felt as if he was the one being comforted. For the next two days, Zoro only slept. Not his usual dozing off on the sofa or leaning against the wall but lying down under a blanket, silent as a dead mouse. Even during sleep, if someone called him or something happened, he would usually wake up, but not this time. Zoro was so still that Megumi commented on it, worrying he wasn't moving at all. He even had a fever at one point, but Sumiki didn't suggest going to the hospital. She realized it wasn't a sickness of the body but of the heart. Instead, Sumiki didn't leave Zoro's side for days, and neither did Megumi. On the morning of the third day, as if nothing had happened, Zoro got up and returned to his regular routine. He woke up early to exercise and prepared breakfast with Sumiki. Sumiki felt relieved seeing this, but didn't ask if he was okay now. Zoro was a very strong person. She had never seen him in such pain before. Of course, he's not okay. He was just pretending to be. For them, who were worried about him. That's why Sumiki had no thoughts of prying into what happened. It would only reopen Zoro's wounds. She thought it was better to wait until Zoro was truly okay to ask. Zoro went outside to check the mailbox. Among several bills, there was one letter envelope. Inside were a memo and a bank book. After indifferently passing over the many zeros in the bank account balance, Zoro read the memo. This was your father's request. Ash Shu Kong Zoro absentmindedly crumpled the memo. Recalling that Toji had left this task to Shu Kong, the anger he had barely calmed over the past few days fled up again. Who asked you for this kind of thing? Leaving behind stuff like this and running away. Zoro clenched his fist tightly enough for blood to form, then slowly relaxed his grip. Getting angry at the dead is meaningless. It doesn't reach them. That made him even angrier. The fact that Toji had gone to a place where Zoro's anger could never reach. Worthless kid. Zoro threw away the memo, and took a deep breath to compose himself before entering the house with only the bank book in hand. Sumiki and Megumi were sitting side by side on the sofa, watching TV. However, it was clear from the program and their expressions, 
that it was just turned on for the sake of it. As Zoro approached, Sumiki and Megumi quickly moved aside to make space for him. Zoro sat between them. Megumi, Sumiki, shall we move? Why all of a sudden? Because there's no one left to come here. Sumiki's mother had been missing for several months now. Toji was dead. Now, there's no one left to return to this house. This place also had too many of those nameless monsters. Megumi had been scared too many times when going out. Those monsters definitely did not appear in places with fewer people, so he thought of moving there. It had been quite some time since they stopped going to school. Do you want to move, brother? Yeah. This was Chia and Toji's home. Now that both of them were dead, there was no longer any reason to stay here. Sumiki nodded firmly. Then let's go. What about you, Megumi? Okay? Alright? Let's go. There's no reason to stay here anymore. Zoro swallowed his words. Several weeks later, Zoro left a letter for Tsumiki's mother in case she returned, entrusted to the new landlord, and completely cleared out the original house. Then, with Shu Kong's help, they moved to a small village in Hokkaido. In this village, where snow stacks up much higher than Tsumiki's height, there were few people, and it was very quiet. People whispered about a house where only children lived, but Zoro paid no mind. They whispered but never called the police, and gradually they became indifferent and naturally accepted Zoro's family. At least Zoro was satisfied with the outcome. With fewer people around, the monsters that scared Megumi hardly appeared. Megumi's sketchbook, once filled with various monster drawings, now featured trees, snow, Zoro, and Tsumiki. When winter came and the first snow fell in the front yard, Megumi and Tsumiki, wearing thick winter clothes, frolicked in the snowfield. Even Zoro joined them, sledding and building a snowman together. The snowman you made looks ugly. Shut up. Tsumiki laughed heartily. Zoro glanced begrudgingly at the snowman, its head thickly adorned with black branches as hair. Although he teased, it was hard to deny that it was just a big, ugly mess. But, is this made by Megumi? What? The snowman looks like Megumi. At Sumiki's words, Zoro realized for the first time that the snowman he made resembled someone from his memory. It somewhat resembled Megumi, but the person Zoro overlapped with was someone else. With its rough hair made of black branches, large size, and a mouth split like a distinctive scar made from branches. Memories leave traces in unexpected moments. Zoro, thinking of his father buried next to Chia, uttered the name cord in his throat. Toji. Toji. Oh, uncle. You remember? Of course, Zoro was more surprised by that. He only remembered meeting him once or twice. Of course I remember. He's your and Megumi's dad. Do you miss him? No. Why? Can't see him. Not anymore. With that reply, Zoro looked up at the sky. Once again, large snowflakes began to fall. There's a lot of snow here. Enough to completely cover things like snowmen. Let's go inside, Tsumiki. Playing outside when it snows this much can be dangerous for children, they might get buried in the snow. It was time to go inside. Zoro, holding Tsumiki's hand with one hand and lifting Megumi from the snow-covered yard with the other, where he had been lying down making snow angels. Let's play more. No. Zoro glanced at the snowman one more time, then without any hesitation, locked the door firmly as he led his siblings inside. That day, the snow continued without pause. It kept falling until Zoro's large snowman was completely covered, non-stop. Are you alive, Satoru? No, I'm dead. Me too. Goho Satoru and Jito Suguru, tattered like sun-dried rags, lay sprawled on the playground, staring blankly up at the sky. The sky was high and clear, a gentle breeze blew, and the temperature was unseasonably warm for November. It was an utterly beautiful day. Instead of enjoying such a day, they were getting beaten up, which only added to their frustration. Goho Satoru murmured dreamily up at the sky. I want to skip. He yearned to do absolutely nothing. There was a new game out, and he wanted to play it with Suguru and Shoko, hoping to get caught by Principal Yaga for playing hooky all day. Under normal circumstances, Jito would have commented on Goho's grumbling, but he was in no state to scold anyone when in pain himself. When you're sore everywhere, the last thing on your mind is to nag someone else. Right now, Suguru was aching in every limb. Toji approached them with a lazy gait and looked down at the two. He then kicked Jito's sprawled body lightly. When are you going to get up? Rise. I'm a corpse. Corpses can't stand up. Want me to make you a real corpse? Goho jeered. Man, you're really persistent with us. What are you? A stalker. A fanboy. I don't have the hobby of focusing on guys. Goho, turning his back to Toji extended his hands as if to use his curse technique lapse. Blue. A blue force began to swell between Goho's hands, but Jito quietly admonished him, Satoru. Toji, not even turning to look at Goho, casually remarked, I can see you making hand seals, young master. ECH. Goho clicked his tongue and lowered his hands, the force dissipating instantly, and Jito slumped even more. Hey, not getting up. If we do, you'll just beat us up again. We're not gorillas like you. It's hard, so hard. For the past two weeks, the two had been regularly receiving physical training from Toji every three days. Though it was called physical training to them, it felt more like a beating. They were hit for being slow, for awkward attacks, for predictable dodging routes, for scheming during a fight basically. 
they were beaten for any reason conceivable during the combat. Naturally, Goho and Jito initially fought back. Of course, Toji never let himself get hit. Instead, when Goho's hand aimed for Toji's face, Toji grabbed it tightly, making a cracking sound, and chuckled. You call that a counterattack? Such attempts are futile. It only gives the enemy an opening. After that, by personally demonstrating this, Toji proved his point by collapsing Jito's stance and slamming him into the ground. Initially excited and retaliating at every hit, the so-called strongest duo also realized after being beaten for days on end. Agreeing it's futile, they learned that pretending to be dead was the safest bet. Toji clicked his tongue in disappointment. The young ones were becoming too cunning for their own good. There's still time left. You should spend time with your children, not us. Jito pointed in the direction where Zoro was playing. Toji glanced over to where his kids were playing. Zoro was napping, and Tsumiki and Megumi were gently covering his body excluding his head with sand using toy shovels. What was that all about? Toji shouted from a distance. Don't hurt Big Brother. Yes, don't worry. We asked if it was okay, and Big Brother said he likes it because it's warm. After all, Zoro wouldn't be bothered by mere sand. If an enemy appeared or something happened, he would break out of the sand tomb, grab the kids, and sprint straight here. Oh, uh, Goho Satoru grimaced, watching Toji turn away from Zoro. Isn't that a bit overprotective? He's the one who defeated a special grade curse. You haven't had him as your kid, that's why. Regardless of strength, Zoro was not exactly a child who inspired confidence when left alone. Whether it's his recklessness or his hopeless sense of direction, he seriously considered getting a GPS for his birthday present, but he wouldn't like it. If Zoro didn't like something, he wouldn't carry it around. And Toji didn't want to give something disliked as a birthday gift. Cheeto laughed. Sounds like a troublemaker. If only he were a typical troublemaker. Toji's worry deepened every time he briefly left Zoro alone, only to find him encountering curses or curse users. If GPS wasn't an option, perhaps an anti-loss necklace. Remembering Zoro eyeing various accessories, especially earrings with interest when passing by a jewelry shop, Toji scratched the back of his head. Enough chit-chat. Stop dragging this out and get up. Goho and Jito's faces crumpled in dismay. They had tried to prolong the conversation with talk of his child. But this gorilla was too perceptive. I'm counting to five. Get up. Five, four, three. Ah, uh, really? Aren't you going to do your duties? Goho sprang up, shouting. Toji pressed down on his dusty white hair firmly. You need to become a sorcerer to have duties. You think the sorcery world would acknowledge someone without cursed energy like me? It was a moot point now. After realizing that all four curse user organizations he had crushed were somehow linked to the higher-ups, Toji lost all desire for recognition from the sorcery world. He retained a competitive desire to fight and defeat strong sorcerers, but any attachment to the position of a sorcerer itself had completely vanished. Being a sorcerer would just mean taking on tasks from those kinds of people. Toji scoffed at the thought. Jito muttered in a voice that sounded incredulous. Even though you're this strong, you're not recognized as a sorcerer. They'll never acknowledge it. That someone who is not a sorcerer can be that strong. Especially the Zenin. Once they found out Zoro was Toji's child and not a sorcerer, the Zenin family completely stopped all investigation and attempts to approach Zoro, not even mentioning him anymore. It must mean they have no interest or curiosity in those who are not sorcerers. The cessation of their advances was a welcome development for Toji but he couldn't shake off the feeling of its persistence. Toji's lips twisted. Goho grumbled as if he couldn't understand. Why wouldn't the sorcery world want a gorilla like you? Even the weakling Yudon works as a sorcerer. Goho, it's not good to talk behind someone's back. Is this talking behind her back? It's the truth. Over the past two weeks of being beaten up by Toji, Goho Satoru and Jito Suguri came to understand. They had to accept the reality. He's strong. The strength of Zen and Toji is real. When he wiped out the curse user organizations, they just accepted it. After all, it was something Goho or Jito could also do. However, Toji's physical combat skills were clearly beyond their reach. Satoru, who always thought he could catch up to any sorcerer eventually, found Toji to be different. It's on a different level. At least in terms of physical combat, Zen and Toji was in a place Goho Satoru could not reach. Gifted physically by being a heavenly restriction with zero cursed energy, Zen and Toji received physical abilities that could kill an ordinary sorcerer in an instant, in exchange for completely losing the biggest potential he could have had. To Goho, it seemed like a power as significant as the cursed energy that was erased. Though Toji himself probably wouldn't think so. Even if I try to finish him off with cursed techniques, it's not easy. Goho's cursed technique reversal. Blue could be easily avoided by Toji just running out of its range, and Jito's summoned spirits were exterminated as soon as they appeared. Maybe for Goho, a user of the Limitless Curse technique, it wasn't a big deal. But from the perspective of Jito, a user of cursed spirits, it was difficult to use curse techniques in every duel without risking his own spirits. How Toji managed to strike curses with his bare hands was a mystery even to Goho. It's certain there must be some trick to it. It wasn't through curse techniques. If it were, Satoru would have noticed. It's just that Toji was too fast and had no cursed energy. 
So it was hard to see exactly what he did to exorcise them with the naked eye. I need to figure it out to either block it or prepare a countermeasure. Thanks to this, Goho Satoru was experiencing frustration for the first time in his life for not being able to discern something. And he's getting more precise with his strikes. He avoids major muscles that could impact a sorcerer's activities, focusing on areas that hurt but recover quickly. The most annoying part was that they couldn't deny their physical skills were improving the more they sparred with Toji. Just yesterday, Satoru managed to exorcise a grade 2 curse with a single punch, without using any cursed energy, just lightly enveloped in physical power. Intending only to subdue it and hand it over to Jito, Satoru was left no choice, but to look down at his hands in dismay and apologize. After exorcising more than three curses this way, a punch flew from Jito, but, like they're blind or something, Goho Satoru internally cursed the higher-ups. The reports he and Jito wrote daily about Toji, who knows where they ended up, despite clearly stating that he's at least a grade 1 sorcerer level, and must be introduced to the sorcery world right away. It would mean less time for this gorilla to beat us if he went on missions. Toji called out to Goho, who showed no signs of getting up. Hey, ah, forget it. I won't do it. I'm not doing it today for real. Unlike you, a jobless guy, we have missions to attend tonight. If you're so eager to fight, why don't you try Yudam or Mei Mei? She's too weak. Mei Mei might be an exception, but he would have to hold back a lot against Yudam. Both her curse techniques and physical combat skills were weak, yet she was overflowing with enthusiasm, risking too much. And I can't come next time anyway. That day is Zoro's birthday yay. Goho cheered, throwing a punch into the air. Dreams do come true. Jito also smiled broadly. Master's birthday. Sincerely congratulations. Why not take this chance to go on a trip for a few days? No, a week. It would create good memories with your children. I'll even cover the travel expenses. Yeah, yeah? Give us money so you and your kids can disappear quickly. Gorilla. Those guys. Toji's brows twitched. Was about to finish them off nicely. Seems like it won't work. Need to correct their attitude. So, we have to do it properly today, right? Seeing Toji emitting a dark aura and approaching. Goho and Jito. Since they had touched a nerve, trying to escape, Jito's shoulder was caught by Toji. Where do you think you're going? Sweating profusely, Jito looked at Satoru for help. Being beaten together was better than being beaten alone. Probably. Deciding, Satoru raised a thumb towards Jito and cheerfully said, Fight on, Jito. This guy, Satoru. You provoked him first. Despite Jito's rare curse, Satoru effortlessly dashed into the woods. Toji started warming up. Don't worry, Jito. I'll catch him soon too. Then, could you please spare me? That's not possible. Soon after, a scream from Jito echoed through the schoolyard. A bit later, in the woods, Goho Satoru's yell and a massive dust cloud rose. Watching this scene through blurry eyes from the principal's office, Yago went back to focusing on the document he was working on. It was a bill for a wall that Goho accidentally destroyed yesterday. His stomach hurt. He felt he needed to buy a lot of cabbages on his way home. His wife would eat them too, so he thought about what kind of cabbage dishes she would like as Yago finished up the bill. Today was November the 11th, 2005, Zoro's sixth birthday. Waking up early, Toji frowned at the feel of a hand stuck to his face. Beside him, Zoro, who had stretched out his arms and legs, was sleeping soundly, unaware his hand had landed on Toji's eye. Toji carefully removed Zoro's hand and silently got out of bed. The small hand that pulled away felt rough with calluses. Toji, who had seen all sorts of things growing up in the Zenin family, didn't recall having such callous hands at this age, but we've been training less lately. Instead, he slept. Like an animal hibernating in winter, apart from eating or playing with his siblings, he only slept. He used to nap a lot already, but recently it had gotten a bit extreme. Is he not feeling well? After all, fighting a special grade curse at the age of five was unprecedented. Moreover, considering his condition was so bad when Shoko first came out of the hospital, that she said he needed at least six months of recuperation. It's natural to think there might be some lingering effects. But I hope he's not hurting. Zoro's eyelids fluttered. Toji had kept his breathing very soft. But Zoro eventually opened his eyes. Did you wake up? Sorry. No, I've slept enough. Zoro stretched and looked at Toji. Why are you looking at me like that? Happy birthday. Ah, so it's already that time. Zoro absentmindedly ran a hand through his somewhat fluffy hair. So, did you wake up early just to say happy birthday? You could have just woken me up. It's not like I've ever really celebrated birthdays in my previous life. Even during my time as a pirate, we didn't celebrate birthdays. Instead, we threw parties whenever we felt like it. And even without birthday parties, every day felt like a feast and was always lively. Toji bit his lip before saying, I'm worried. Hum, you've been sleeping a lot lately. Ah, Zoro was aware of it too. Zoro absentmindedly scratched the back of his head. I've been dreaming. Dreams? Yeah. 
There had been several instances of strange dreams since his reincarnation, but recently those instances had become more frequent. When he had those dreams, it was hard to wake up unless he sensed some external stimulus. Nightmares. No. When he dreamt, a few recurring dreams would emerge. Dreams where a white path appeared out of darkness. Dreams of being utterly still. Unable to feel the ground beneath his feet, the air in his lungs, or anything with his eyes. Or dreams where he refused to walk down the white path, turning away several times, and eventually stepping off it altogether. Each was peculiar, but none felt unpleasant or distressing. Come to think of it, I haven't heard that metallic scraping sound since that day. The click-click noise that often accompanied his dreams hadn't been heard since Zoro killed the special grade curse and seemed to break something in his dream. Instead, the dreams themselves continued. But today's dream was one I've never had before. A throbbing heart and a fragile, beautiful red thread barely holding together were the choices given in the dream. And Zoro made his choice. The vigorous beating of the heart and the soft texture of the thread he held remained vivid even after waking from the dream and some time passing. Too vivid for a dream. Was it a dream or a memory? If it were a memory, from when? If today's dream was a memory, were the previous dreams also memories? Seeing Toji's face darken, Zoro snapped out of his thoughts and tapped Toji's forehead with his finger. Don't worry, Zoro wasn't someone to be swayed by mere dreams, and these dreams weren't unpleasant or unnatural to begin with. They felt more like things finding their rightful place. Zoro, who had been gently rubbing Toji's forehead, stood up. I'm hungry. Let's eat. If something's bothering you, make sure to tell me. I said I got it. Is there anything you want to do today? Anything you want to eat? Well, how about a trip? To the mountains or the sea? Toji lightly suggested, recalling the mocking from Goho and Jito a few days ago, telling him to take a trip and never come back. Traveling abroad might be too much for the kids since they were still young. But a day or two's trip within the country was definitely doable. The sea... Huh, it wasn't a bad idea. Zoro had seen it plenty in his previous life, but never in this world. For Megumi and Tsumiki, experiencing a variety of things would be beneficial. Zoro recalled something he read in a parenting book. Memories before the age of three might not be concretely remembered when older, but the emotions felt then can leave an implicit mark. Going out to sea wasn't always purely enjoyable and happy, but Zoro learned about the world through the sea. If he hadn't gone out to sea, he would have remained a frog in a well, full of arrogance and ignorance, with only a small bit of strength. The sea in this world is different from his previous life, and Megumi and Sumiki might not feel the same as Zoro did, but he still wanted to show it to them once, to show them how vast the world is. Let's go to the sea. After breakfast, the four of them drove to the seaside. Smelling the distinctive salty air, Zoro smiled familiar with the sensation. Even if the world changes, the sea remains the sea. Toji parked the car and helped Zoro, Megumi, and Tsumiki out one by one. Together, they walked towards the sea. The cool sea breeze, moist and salty, blew towards them. It was quite cold in November. But the kids weren't cold because they were dressed warmly for winter. Upon reaching a spot where the sea's expanse was visible, Megumi, seeing the sea for the first time, lit up. Wow. His small mouth opened wide, and he bounced on his feet. Sumiki's eyes widened as well. Is this the sea? It's so vast how far does it go? Zoro shrugged. To the end of the world. Wow. Megumi reacted just like Zoro, making him chuckle. Holding hands tightly, Sumiki and Megumi ran towards the sandy beach. They jumped around excitedly in front of the crashing waves. I want to go in. It's too cold now. Toji firmly said no, causing Tsumiki to pout. I want to go in. Though, you can dip your hands and feet Megumi. Megumi, who had been splashing the seawater, suddenly sucked on his hand. Zoro quickly pulled Megumi's hand out of his mouth, alarmed. Megumi grimaced. Salty, the sea is made of salt water. Spit it out. Hey, spit, spit. Megumi spat out the saltiness. Oh boy, Zoro used his sleeve to thoroughly wipe Megumi's mouth. Don't drink the sea water. You can dip your hands and feet in it. Take off your shoes and socks. Make sure your clothes don't get wet. Okay. Zoro took off Megumi's shoes and socks, while Toji did the same for Tsumiki. Tsumiki buried her feet in the sand, rubbing them and giggling. It feels weird. It's different. The sand at playgrounds and the sand on a beach feel entirely different. The slimy sensation of seawater, the fragments of broken seashells occasionally brushing between the toes, and the waves rolling in and out. Swoosh. Crash. The waves hit the sandy beach breaking into white foam. Megumi flapped his arms. I wanna swim. Swim. Like a fish. You can't. What about Big Brother? I can do it. You can't either. Toji, alarmed, grabbed Zoro. Wait, have you ever swum before? Of course. In Zoro's previous world, the sea was visible wherever you went, so except for those who had eaten a devil's fruit, and couldn't do anything in water except sink, most knew how to swim. Not to mention the fishmen, who could breathe underwater without saying. With many crew members possessing devil fruit powers, it was mostly Zoro, a non-user, who ended up rescuing those who fell into the water before Jin joined. This included Luffy, of course, as well as Chopper, Brooke and Robin. Robin was cautious, so she rarely fell into the water. And even if Zoro was ready to help, 
That damn cook usually beat him to it. Zoro made a face as he recalled the curly eyebrows that he had not seen in a long time. Even after dying and being reborn, he still disliked that man. Why are you making that face all of a sudden? No, just remembered someone I dislike. To erase the face from his mind, Zoro turned his gaze towards the kids. Sumiki and Megumi had stopped splashing water and were now sitting side by side on the sandy beach, watching a passing hermit crab. It would have been nice to go into the sea if it was summer. Maybe we'll come back in the summer. Not bad. Although the autumn sea was also nice, it was too cold for the kids. Zoro glanced at Sumiki. Speaking of which, we might need to get Sumiki some more winter clothes soon. I'll check if there are any clothes left at their place. Sumiki's mother and the man she was living with hardly came home anymore. Sumiki hadn't returned to that house either, and had been staying at Zoro's place. Toji recalled the text message he had sent to Tsumiki's biological mother a few days ago. He had left a message just in case she was looking for Tsumiki, but he didn't expect a reply. She doesn't answer the phone, doesn't come home. They didn't know where Tsumiki's mother was, and it seemed Tsumiki didn't know either. Though not formally adopted, Tsumiki was essentially adopted by Toji still bearing the name Fushiguro. Zoro turned his gaze away from Tsumiki and back to the sea. Nice. The sea was moderately vast, breezy, and open. He didn't think as much about the past as he expected. Of course, it was impossible not to think about it at all. But he didn't feel overwhelmed by memories of the past. This sea was different from that of his past life. Different in its expanse, the mysteries it held, and the world it was part of. This world sea may still have its unsolved mysteries but nothing compared to a sea that only two groups in history had ever circumnavigated in Zoro's previous life. It wasn't the sea where he adventured with his captain and crew, encountering friends and foes, and eventually making his name known across all seas. But the sea is still the sea, a majestic natural force that can make humans feel infinitely small, a realm fundamentally different from land, filled with its own power and mystery, beckoning for exploration, adventure, and challenges. Well, maybe Zoro felt that way because that's just who he is. What are you thinking about? I want to win. Win against who? The sea. You really are something. Toji shook his head and casually tidied up his hair that was messed up by the sea breeze. I can't tell if that's childlike or just plain stupid, but sometimes Zoro seems much more mature than Toji, and at other times, he seems as enlightened as Buddha. He's unpredictable. From behind, he just looks like a round, fluffy marimo. Zoro gave Toji a smirk, and then turned his gaze back to the sea. Just as the letters written in the sand were erased without a trace by the waves, the subtle feelings Zoro had been harboring from the dreams he had been having lately vanished. Whether it's a memory or a dream, it doesn't matter. If it's an obstacle, cut it down. If it helps, keep it. No more hesitation. What remains is the subtle excitement and anticipation similar to when he first left his hometown to set out to sea, along with an unyielding will and dream. Zoro gripped the handle of Wado Ichimonji. I want to become stronger. To become so strong that, this time, truly become the strongest across all seas. To become a swordsman who doesn't need to cut anything. Because being able to not cut anything means being able to cut everything. Zoro laughed refreshingly as he faced the sea breeze. He felt glad to have come here. That day, Zoro spent time collecting seashells with his siblings, feasted on sashimi at a seaside restaurant, and trained until evening while enjoying the sea breeze. At night, Toji dragged him back to their accommodation to sleep. And he dreamt the same dream he had the night before. The dream about the throbbing heart and the red string. Thump thump. Zoro alternately looked at the heart and the red string loosely tied around his hand. The thin red string, swaying in endless darkness, led back to where Zoro had come from. Beyond the darkness towards a place where the sea scent lingered and the sunlight poured. Zoro, just as before, did not pull but let go of the heartbreakingly beautiful red string that was slowly unraveling and drifting away from him, and turned towards the increasingly fragile and faintly pulsating heart. Thump thump when Zoro touched the heart that was about to stop, the heart dispersed into white light. Somehow, a deep sense of relief washed over him. Yesterday's dream ended the moment he let go of the red string, but today was different. Well, he would wake up soon anyway, Zoro thought nonchalantly. Someone behind Zoro hugged him tightly. Surprised, he tried to look back. But he couldn't. He had no strength. I love you. Thump thump. Zoro paused as he searched for his sword. The sound coming from the person hugging him was exactly like the heart that had disappeared earlier. Moreover, this voice was. Mother. As Zoro asked, the embrace tightened. My baby. My son. Mommy is so sorry and thankful. I should have been there for you more. I shouldn't have left like that. Zoro just listened to the voice, wet with tears, continuing. His mouth wouldn't move. Zoro, you did well enough. Before and after. As the arms unwrapped, Zoro quickly turned around. His eyes widened. It really was Chia. Chia smiled with teary gray eyes. Live healthily, happily. That's all I wish for. With that whisper, Chia disappeared into white light, just like the heart did earlier. Although the dream ended there, Zoro continued to sleep deeply throughout the night. A very deep and peaceful sleep. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second.
That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.